Hello and welcome to episode 35 of Think Big with Michael Zellner, all positive, no politics. My guest today is Mark Goodfellow. Mark is a local television commercial personality. He's an athlete and an entrepreneur. He can be seen sitting courtside at every Memphis Grizzlies basketball game and is well known in Memphis by, I would say, just about everyone. He's also the owner of It's All Good Auto Sales at 2944 South Third in Memphis, Tennessee. Mark, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having, thanks for coming on today. Yes, sir. So tell us something interesting about yourself. Most people don't know. Uh, something interesting. Well, I grew up in a trailer. Uh, I've always been a dreamer. Uh, and I had a mother that always loved me, so I didn't go without, but you know, growing up in a trailer itself, that's, that's about enough said. Right. And so, you know, you told me you grew up in uh, Marion, Arkansas, and you lived, you know, right across the bridge in Memphis for people that are, are not from here and growing up in a trailer. What do you remember most about your childhood? I grew up in West Memphis and then I moved to Marion a little bit okay. older, but uh, I was a very, very great athlete. Uh, my father worked, you know, two jobs. So uh, I was always around my mom. Um, just. I always had a, just a little craziness in me, I guess. So you started your car dealership. Uh, it's all good auto sales you know, over 26 years ago. Um, you started off with only four cars of which you said two didn't work. You made your car, your office because it had windows that you could see people coming in and out of the lot from. Tell us a little bit about the first person that you sold a car to. Yeah, that's another thing. A lot of people don't know. I didn't start with a silver spoon. Uh, you know, I was a professional gambler at the Greyhounds and I saw an end coming. I knew I had to do something else because I had a high taste and I lived a very good life. Uh, my dad kicked me out of the house when I was 18. So he was the last person I wanted to deal with. But my mother, the love of my life, asked me to please come over to Memphis because my dad had opened just a pallet light up. I knew I wasn't going to help him, but I had to come back from Miami once a year to do my, you know, taxes. So when I visited Third Street, his pallet lot, the casinos were just being built or, you know, been built. And I just, I was always been great with numbers. And I was counting like a thousand cars per minute going by. And that's when this, it's all good. Not it's all good. Just a used car lot came to my mind because I knew how hard it was to get cars back then. Right. So, so guys, I'm first, sorry. The first girl that came up to my business, I had four cars, like I told you, to make it look like a car lot. Two didn't work. She wanted the ones that didn't work. And I knew I couldn't sell her that. So I said, honey, listen to me. Buy this one right here. I know it don't look good. She was a pretty girl. I said, come back in six months. I promise you I'll be established and I'll sell you another one. And the rest is history. That's what happened. So several years later, uh, the Memphis Grizzlies moved into town and, and you came up with a marketing idea to tie your dealership in with the Grizzlies. Uh, as what our mutual friend, uh, Romeo Kazin calls you, quote, a marketing genius. You know, everything is about branding and self-promotion. How did you come up with this brilliant plan? Well, when I opened up It's All Good, I knew I had to do two things. I had to get a good repo team because I deal with people with bad credit. I believe in giving people a second opportunity. You know, I've got a second opportunity in my life. It had to be way more than an hour to go over that. And two, I knew I had to market myself to let people, you know, I've always been a showman, so I really wanted to market myself. So when the Memphis Grizzlies came, I can't remember what I had for lunch a couple of days ago, but I can remember this like it was yesterday. I was so excited. I had to be front row and the tickets are only $500. And that's when that started. When I got my tickets, I knew that's when my marketing genius could come out. Uh, I'm a flair for colors back in the day. I sort of toned it down a little bit. And I grew up in Miami at the dog tracks. So I had all these Don Johnson suits. So I'd wear a different suit, tailor-made suit, every day to the games. And everybody's white, black, green, yellow would always say, oh, my God, that's the car guy. And that's what I wanted to do. I love the Don, you know, I'm a big, I grew up to Miami Vice as a kid. So I love the Don Johnson suits. I thought yeah. they were great. 
you know, not everyone, you know, loves or even more importantly can handle being in the spotlight all the time. And that isn't the case with you at all. You've been referred to in Memphis as the quote, the Jack Nicholson of the Grizzlies. It's very apparent from uh, seeing you at the games and in, per in person and on TV that you truly enjoy making people smile, laugh, and pumping them up, don't you? Yes, I'm, uh, I'm a very competitive, confident guy, but, you know, I like to have fun also. Where did you come up with your company tagline, I don't care about your credit, I care about you? I want to take credit for that, but I cannot. Billy Grace my ex general manager came up with that. And that is a tagline that has made me millions of dollars. I mean, everybody knows that it's all good. And uh, when you're selling cars to people with second opportunities, you know, I don't care about your credit. I care about you. You got them. Right. I understand that you have a uh, pretty good story about uh, the dog track and, and dog racing. Can you share a little bit about that? There's so many, there's so many dog track stories. You know, I can tell you, I can remember, uh, you know, my dad worked at the dog track, but my father was a very, you know, honest, hardworking, religious man. He did not want me around the dog track. So I don't know if this is a story you want, but this is a great one. I used to go to the dog track, beg, 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 beg my father. I mean, I always was in love and with money, but I didn't have any money. So he'd let me go on Saturdays only. And they had 12 races on Saturdays. And after the dogs run, they have to walk. So I would walk the dogs for $1. So I'd make $12. And I thought I was Al Capone. I walked home and I never spent a penny. Every Saturday, I could not wait to make the $12. To make a long story short, I become one of the top handicappers in the United States of America. Uh, dogs are just like athletes. We bought the tapes. The dogs run the same. So I studied. I didn't go over and just get lucky. I put two and three hours a day into this. When I got very successful, you know, people, as they talk now about people, uh, start putting my daddy in the thing. So my daddy did not want me in the dog track. So he had me kicked out for a non-reason. I can remember this like yesterday. I went to a lawyer. I mean, it was my life. The money I'm making was ridiculous. I went to a lawyer and he said, Mark, they're calling you an undesirable. Go get a job and get your name in lights. Go get a job and get your name in lights. Well, I was already gambling for all the car men in Memphis, the general managers, I was taking their money over there, making them money, putting my money in my pocket, giving them back what I wanted to give them. And I had on a piece of paper, you know, Chuck, he's up 10,000 this week. Well, I'll just take his money. So I had a system of making everybody happy. So I went to work at Covenant Pike Toyota because that's where I was getting the money from a lot of those people. And the sales of the week was on, on that big board. You remember the old Covenant Pike Toyota? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jerry Melton was a top salesman there because he had all the police, you know, credit union and stuff. Uh, my first month, I made $37,000. I was 19 years old. Wow. I got my name in lights four weeks in a row. I can't remember how I got it. I don't know if we had phones in or something, but I got the information back to my lawyer. I got reinstated into the dog track and the next day i quit a thirty-seven thousand dollar month job that's how much money i was making at the track wow that is i've never heard of anyone come close to making that much money in, in a month selling cars that's amazing well now i will say this back in the day covenant pike was one of the top sellers in the country right you know, we sold 1200 cars a month but here's the kicker we had 111 salesmen Wow. Come on, man. That's unbelievable. Um, you once said, quote, your future does not depend on the opinions or the permission of others. What does that mean to you? That means that I don't deposit excuses. I make shit happen. You know, I've been an underdog my whole life. Like I told you, I grew up in a trailer. My mama believed in me, said I could do anything I ever wanted in life. 
she did not she did not like me gambling but i've made a damn successful life of the way i live tell the audience uh about your encounter uh one night with former uh, boston celtics boston celtics greats uh kevin garnett paul pierce and ray allen i believe it's spendini here in Memphis. oh wow well it started with the pump brothers i'm sure you've heard of them yeah uh, out of la they had the number one aau basketball team in the nation and Armand Hill, which was assistant coach for the Celtics, I met him. And as a lot of people, he fell in love with me. So we coached his AU team for the weekend, and he invited me to the Boston Celtics practice. I'm, my mind's not as sharp as it used to be. I think it was 2007 they won the NBA championship, and I was at several practices, and I had this high personality. And Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, they all fell in love with me. And I was telling them I took the place of Elvis when he died. And they just thought I was bullshit. But, you know, they loved me. Right. So I said, when you come to Memphis, you make sure you look me up and I'll show you who I am. I said, in Memphis, these are three Hall of Famers. Right. And I promise you, when you come to Memphis, they won't be calling your name out. They'll be calling my name out. And they just love me. Uh, me and Ray Allen, we played golf. We hustled golf on the golf course. We did all kinds of things. Well, the year they won the NBA championship, you know, they all came to Memphis. They didn't, they weren't even playing. They weren't even supposed to come, but they wanted to see me. And I was sick as heck. And I told them, man, I, I just can't make it out. And they said, are you kidding? You've been talking that shit all this year. We're about to win an NBA championship for you. So I gutted it out, very competitive. And we met them at Spendini's. And as we walked in, now imagine Kevin Garnett, 6'11", right. Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, and they're screaming out, it's all good. I'm just pumping Kevin Garnett in the ass. It's all good. Catch me at the game, sit in front row. And they're loving it. They're smiling. Not one person said nothing to them until we sat down. Uh, being who I am, I've always been a little, uh, I always look around. That's just who I am. Uh as I'm walking in, John Calipari's, I see all kind of people. I'm an avid tennis player. That's another thing people don't know about me, a three-time national champion. And I had to look three tennis girls over there in the corner. All were married. And I saw that they'd been drinking. So I didn't want to deal with them. Plus, I had three Hall of Famers with me. You know, I wanted to spend time with them. I waved at them, and that, that's all I should have done. Well, you know, these women – you know, they've got their own cocky personalities too. Right. So we're sitting over there at the table and we're having a good time. And all of a sudden I get a letter from the waitress. This girl said, meet me outside right now. I pass that letter to Paul Pierce. Two minutes later, she passed me up another letter. She says, I want to give you a blow job right now outside. I give that to Ray Allen. We continue on. We continue on our, our, our meal, and the check was about to come. We had the limousine. We're all going to Romeo's Gamble at the casinos. And, you know, they were furious because I didn't give them any attention. If those three people would not have been in Memphis, I would have sat with them. Right. And, and would have took, you know, the offer. So as I was paying the bill, Ray Allen paid the bill. I'm up paying the bill. The girl gets up behind me. And as I turn around, I touch her because she's right up on me. I don't know. You know I tell you that I'm looking around. I guess I can't see back behind me, but I'm just so excited about the night and who I'm hanging with. I mean, I couldn't make this up. Everybody's screaming my name. It went perfect. And I turned around and I hit her and she's all up on me. She says, don't you touch me. Unless you drive a Mercedes Benz, make a million dollars a year, and got a 10-inch cock. Well, I know I ain't got 10-inch, <laughs> but I got the first two, and I get so red. I mean, I'm gushing with red. You know, my mama taught me, son, sometimes you got to take the high road. You know what I want to do? I look at Calipari, and he's looking at me. He's, he's with his wife. His wife's red. He's... He's looking at me. Are you going to take that good fella? And the car salesman came out with me. And I said, let me tell you something, you fucking bitch. I do drive a Mercedes Benz, 
I do make a million dollars a year and I ain't cutting two inches off my cock for nobody. <laughs> they give me a standing ovation. <laughs> Knowing I got about four and a half, I told her I had a foot dick. <laughs> That's one of the funniest things I've heard in a long time. <laughs> oh my God. What a great story. Oh my God. That's so awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, you have a, a pretty special relationship with a lot of people, Mark, and we're going to talk about several of them today. One of them is a mutual friend of ours, uh, Greg Graber. Uh, tell us a little bit about your relationship with Greg. Man, I really give Greg. Uh, got so much respect for him and his wife. He was the first guy that did an article on me and uh, just always had a lot of respect for him. Uh, through the Grizzlies, his wife is from Arkansas. And just, just a, to be honest, kind of guy that I want to be like. You know, I'm a little loud and funny. He's very professional, but I just have mutual, mutual respect for Greg. Great man. He is. I met him about seven years ago, reached out to him on Facebook you know, for some mindfulness training. And he's really helped me a lot over the years and we've become good friends. So I really value his friendship myself. Good guy. Yes. You once said, quote, when you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love. So true. What does that mean to you? Those are all teachings from my mom. And, you know, like you said, my mom is gone. My brother's gone. You know, I, I'm a little bit older now. You know, I didn't think about that when, when, when I made that quote. It's just we're, we're so blessed every day that we wake up. Uh, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm perfect because, you know, I'm miserable too and very successful. But it's just such a privilege to be breathing and waking up and enjoying this beautiful life that we have in front of us. There's a story about a, a flight to Knoxville that you were on with the late Rusty Heineman on his plane. Can you share some of that with us? Oh, my God. You're bringing back all the goodies. Uh, well, Romeo was on that flight, too. Uh, you know, also a first-class person. We grew up together. Uh, uh, very happy with what he's doing in life. But uh, Rusty was a very, very, very special friend of mine. Uh, I loved his wife. That was back in the heydays with John Calipari. Uh, uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Probably the greatest times of my life. Not only did we go to the Final Fours and the Sweet 16, we went to every freaking game. And, you know, getting invited on a private plane, I mean, that is the ultimate. I've been addicted ever since. But on this one flight to Knoxville, which is the, probably the shortest flight we ever made, it was Romeo's birthday or, or some kind of special occasion. And uh, I, I don't want to misquote this word. Uh, they got him like a turpin or something. Is that the correct word? I think that's right. You, you know, for his birthday. Right. And for some odd reason, I, was, I had to throw up. And it's, you know, it says God works in mysterious ways. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes you just blurt it out. Maybe I was such a, you know, athlete that I grabbed his turban and threw up in his turban. And I'm not talking about throwing up, you know, like two. I mean, it was all the way to the top of the hat. And you know how a plane is. I mean, nobody can keep uh, uh, that much. I didn't spill a freaking inch. And when we got off, his turban was ruined, but nothing got on Rusty's plane. <laughs> I'm sure he was happy about that. Yeah. You know, you have been involved uh, with sports your whole life. Uh, you play or coach basketball, baseball, football, golf, table tennis, tennis. And speaking of tennis, and you talked about that, you're, it's a huge passion of yours. You're very involved with it on many different levels. You had a chance in uh, 2014 to play doubles in an exhibition match with um, your uh, partner was Boris uh, Kojo, an actor against the the Bryan brothers, Bob and Mike, who, you know, they held the number one ranking in the world for like 430 something weeks. Um, oh God. You have uh, the naming rights to the new spectacular Leftwich Tennis Center in, in Ottoman Park in Memphis. It's currently being built and 
you said you won, you know, doubles championships. You finished third in the nation. What does tennis mean to you? Man, man, you're bringing back memories. Uh, a, uh, in my mother's honor, I named the tennis facility after her. It's Goodfella Outdoor Courts, but that's because of my mama trying to leave a legacy for our family. Awesome. Uh, when I grew up, I was an unbelievable athlete. But tennis, you know, to me, you know, tennis was for pussies. You know, football, basketball, baseball, you know, that was the three sports. Right. But I was – another thing people don't know about me, I was grounded my whole life. So I could not leave the garage, literally. So I made my mother buy me a ping pong table. So every day I'd play up against, you know, I'd, I'd put the other ping pong table up and just play up against it. I mean, ain't nobody in the city can beat me in ping pong. That's how good I was. So tennis, it's amazing. I didn't have women on my wall. I had beyond Borg on my wall growing up because I loved it. I just didn't want to play it, you know, as a sport. So me being so competitive, I told my mom, I said, mom, listen, I don't give a shit what daddy said. I'm fucking running away if you don't get me out of this damn house. So one day she said, Mark, get in the car. She had me a tennis racket. And I went down to the high school and played after and got a couple private lessons, you know, from a tennis coach. After that, you know, I was very cocky. I wanted to play the whole tennis team. So I went and I beat them all. Make a long story short, in 1982, Marion, Arkansas, we won the state championship in baseball. I hit a double off the left field wall to win it. As I'm leaving, you know I'm so excited. As I'm leaving, they have the state champion tennis match going on. First time in Marion history. Well, I'm not even on the team. So in my baseball uniform and my flip-flops, I walk out onto the court right before the play and say, Coach, Coach. We just won the state championship. Let me win you a state championship in tennis. He said, good fella, get your ass off the court. <laughs> well, as you know, I didn't listen to my daddy, so you know I didn't listen to him. Right. And I'm, I'm supposed to be a salesman. I keep trying to please let me play. He said, good fella, if you don't get off this court, I'm going to beat your ass. So as I'm walking off the court, I come back one more time and I say, coach, ask your players. I can beat every single one of them. He asked them. They shook his head in my baseball uniform. I won the state championship in tennis in 1982. Yeah, I grew up. That? That's unbelievable. Yeah, I grew up with the you know the same era, the Borg, Connors, McEnroe, the best era in tennis by best far. In my ever. You know, and I remember the 91 the U.S. Open when Connors was almost 40 years old. He made it all the way to the semifinals, ended up losing to Courier in the semifinals. But one of the quotes that's always stuck with me is Jimmy Connors. I hate to lose more than I love to win. 1,000%. That's my, my same motto. My same motto. I've lost in tennis, but, man, it, it, it'll stick with me for weeks, and I'll find a way to come back and beat that same group. You know, uh, I don't lose much, but when I do, I cannot stand it. I don't care if it's for the national championship, state championship, or just a local match. I'm very competitive. Also, I think that's why I'm successful in business, my competitiveness. Absolutely. Um, you said, quote, front row everywhere I go, Grizz Nation, stand up. There's a great picture of you with that quote uh, with you and Denzel Washington from uh, back in May of 2015. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with Denzel. Man, you know, what a great man. That also goes back to the Pump Brothers. I met the Pump Brothers in Hawaii. That story would be too long. Make a long story short. Only one of them was there. And, you know, he fell in love with me. Uh, they were coaching this number one AAU team. And they said they were coming to Fayetteville. Another thing that people, as I talk, things are hitting in my head. Another thing people don't know about me. I always wanted just to be a coach. I'm, I just always wanted to be a freaking basketball coach and when this thing come I could not wait and they were the first game was it's called the thrill thrill on the hill in Fayetteville so I went down to Fayetteville and like you as you said I'm very stupid on all this I'm, I was definitely stupid on directions 
So I got lost three or four times to Fayetteville with all them country roads. Make a long story short, I get there. I'm starving because, you know, I've been smoking a little bit of weed because I was getting furious. And as I, I, I've always been a great judge of talent. I don't care clothes, cars, fashion, athlete, dogs. It's just something in me. And after five minutes, I knew I had three pros on my team. Drew Holiday, which was one over, which was one of them. I had the Wear Twins. I had Reeve Nelson. I had Lorando Ward's kid. I had Larry Drew's kid. We had an unbelievable team. But as I walked in, I see this one kid over on his phone. But, you know, I just had met everybody. I was so happy to get this job. You know, I didn't want to, you know, throw out the real Mark Goodfellow stuff. So we got through with practice. As you know, I just had a four and a half, five hour drive and I was starving. So we all met for dinner. I'm sitting down eating and freaking Denzel Washington walks to meet the pumps. And I'm not starstruck at all, but he is my favorite actor. So I just kept eating because that was, that was their kid. If you know the pumps, each year they have annual cancer. 50 of the top athlete and Hall of Famers go to their gala. Jerry West, Bill Walton, Bill Russell, Bo Jackson, Deion Sanders, some of the greatest men have been, you know, awarded, you know, through their story. And very rarely does somebody bust my balls, but sometimes in life, you know, you have to take it. Sure. You just can't make people laugh. Sometimes you got to, you know, get laughed on yourself. So that's about halfway through my meal. They looked over and they asked me, you know, what do you think about practice? Well, I've already told them about, you know, I've already called home saying I got three pros on my team. And I said, man, practice was great. I said, who's that cocksucker over on his phone? Why is he on the team for? And Denzel Washington looks at me and says, that's my son. <laughs> I mean, I, it looked like a fucking a truck hit me. Well, I didn't know what to say, but I didn't apologize. And I just kept eating. And he didn't smile at me. He, he, he won the movie, won the movie looks. Right. And I looked at the pumps and I was ready to beat their ass, but I just waited till, you know, Denzel left and they started laughing their ass off. And I had to laugh at myself. I said, you cock sucker, you. <laughs> anyway, the next term it was in Vegas or LA, one of the two. And they told me that Denzel and his son had a, you know, problem. And man, you know, I tell you, I wanted to be a coach, but I'm an unbelievable motivator. I mean, I had Drew Holiday, we don't have enough time, running through a brick wall for me. And he's an, an NBA champion. It's just my passion. My passion comes out. And they're talking to me. I said, man, I can help this guy. And they had just met me, and they know I'm a time bomb. But they also believe me because I told you, my daddy kicked me out of my house. I know all about that shit. I wanted to kill my father. Now I feel sorry for my father. He's in a freaking bed with advanced dementia, but we can't go there. And I kept begging and begging and begging. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to honor Denzel for you know, one of their awards. I said, man, I'm telling you, I can get this done because you know Denzel was over the you know, sort of on the fence, too, because these punk brothers, as you see, they had a lot of stories about them over the ticket scandals, to this, to that, right. and Martin Fox, all great people. Anyway, they called me one more and said, I set up the meet. Oh, my God, it was one of the happiest days of my life. You know, I'm never nervous, but could you imagine? I had, you know, when you get nervous and bumps in my stomach, I go to this house, I have a talk with his son, his wife's there, he's not there. Man, in 30 minutes, his wife's crying, I'm crying, the son's crying. Man, it was unbelievable. That The reason why I was there, USC, Notre Dame, is at the, it was in LA, it was at the, at, the, at the Coliseum, the biggest college game in the country. Like I told you, I wasn't on the front row, I was on the sidelines. Right because of the pumps. Well, another thing I don't tell you, I'm in the Beverly Hilton Wilshire the night before 
taking 20 and in passes from Joe Montana, my favorite quarterback of all times. He was one of the recipients with the pumps. As I'm walking on the field, I mean, you know, I'm not known in L.A. like I am in Memphis. I'm not going to lie to you. Right. But being on the field for that game, it's just – it's a feeling that you, you could – it's indescribable. Well, guess who I walk into? Joe Montana. He said, Goody, please walk with me to the locker room. That way he'd have to stop and talk to every Notre Dame player. So as I'm walking Joe Montana on the freaking field, I mean, imagine how happy I was. I drop him off. I turn around and I fucking see Denzel Washington. Now, he didn't call me Goody. He called me Memphis. And he's looking at me again with those crazy-ass eyes. I'm scared. He, he thought I was like an evangelist because his son had already called him and said, Dad, I want to have a conversation with you. He says, who are you? And this is one of my taglines. I says, I'm Mark Goodfellow. I took the place of Elvis when he died. I knew that would make him laugh, right? Right. Not a shimmer. Still with them stole cone eyes. He says, I'm not going to ask you again, son. Who are you? I said, man, I'm Mark Goodfellow from Memphis, Tennessee. And he almost starts crying. And he says, man, my son. And I want to have a conversation tonight. I really appreciate what you did. I said, well, you appreciate the punks because I went to him and told him I could help your son. I had an unbelievable relationship with my father. He says, how much do I owe you? And he pulls out his checkbook. I said, man, you don't owe me nothing. What an unbelievable night. He says, in life, if I ever owe you anything, you let me know. Night goes on. We have an unbelievable night. That night, we have a rooftop party at a club in L.A. Denzel walks in. He's asking for one person, Mark Goodfellow. Now, you want to talk about a celebrity? When he walked on that rooftop, Michael, the whole freaking party just, you just could tell it move right. to him. And he came right over to me and sat right beside me and started talking to me and again told me how appreciative he was and if I could ever do anything for him. We got time to finish the story. Uh, we're good. We're good on time. Yeah. I have so, several more questions to go, so we're good. So years later, you know, we say hi and bye, and I see him at the pump events because I went for like eight years in a row. Years go by. Oh, my God, this is so great. And I'm at the biggest boxing match in the country. Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather. And you know me, I'm front row everywhere I go. Hmm. I'm telling, bragging everybody. To, when I get there, I don't even have a fucking ticket, much less front row. Front rows are going for a half a million. Now, I got a lot of money, but I'm not paying half a million. Because, you know, Floyd Mayweather was going to win like in two rounds. Right. But I've got also my pool in Vegas, too. And I was on a diet back then. So, I mean, it's it's fight night, and I still don't have a ticket. Upper decks, the top seat in the arena, 10000 So I said, you know what? I'm just going to bet it and watch it and somehow try to finagle a way in because everybody thinks I'm going to be on the front row. I'm eating dinner, and I get a phone call from a guy that says, get your ass over here right now. I got you a ticket. I said, how much? He said, $1,000. I said, I'm on the way. My food was just coming. I couldn't eat it. I was starving. Michael, I'm on the front, not the front row, but the front row behind the front row. About a $100,000 ticket. Jay-Z, Tom Brady, they're all behind me. Beyonce. Ever, Jamie Foxx is doing the national anthem. Everybody's there. The guy told me one thing. He says, Mark, please go in there and just be cool. Don't say anything. This is my job, man. You know, he, this guy owed me a lot of favors. It was at least a $100,000 ticket. Now, remember, I'm starving. and I'm on a diet. And I get in there, and I ain't said a word. And they're the best, you know, them damn cute cocktail girls are in Vegas. Right. 
the most prettiest girl walks by me selling hot dogs. And I said, man, I got to have a hot dog. I get a hot dog and my Mountain Dew, my favorite drink, and I spill mustard on me. And I scream like a little baby, like I got shot. I said, bring me some club soda. And everybody beside me, uh, who was the big center back in the day that had a good career? He's about seven foot tall back at that time. Uh, not Is it not Bynum or Andrew? Uh, Andrew Bynum? It, did he play at – was he a center for the Lakers? He was a center for the Lakers, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's beside me. I mean, rappers are beside me. Yeah, I'm telling you about Jay-Z, Beyonce. I said, bring me some club soda. And I screamed like a little baby. I was supposed to be quiet. About two minutes later, fucking Denzel Washington walks in. And you remember he said, whatever you need, I got you. But the guy said, Mark, please be quiet. I said, fuck this. I stand up in my seat. I don't sit up. I stand up in it. And I scream to Denzel, 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 Memphis, Memphis, Memphis. Because he (laughs) called me Memphis. He don't look at me. But everybody in the goddamn arena is looking at me. I do it again. Denzel, Denzel, Memphis, Memphis. And I'm saying to myself, this motherfucker, I know he saw me. About one minute later, fucking security, two black security guards come out. I said, man, Mark, you got to be the dumbest son of a gun in the country. You got a $100,000 ticket for $1,000. All you got to do is shut your damn mouth. So you know I'm getting kicked out, right? They come and get me. And they escort me down right next to Denzel Washington on the front freaking row. He just flew in uh, some movie he was shooting. He looked, I've never seen him that bad. He's got a hat. I think he played a mechanic or something in this movie. And I start talking to him. And I told you I'm not starstruck, but I had to get a picture on the front row to prove to everybody. And forget Denzel Washington. I'm just on the front row. So we're talking for about five or six minutes. And I mean, women are trying to talk to him. And he said, don't you see me trying to talk, man? I mean, uh, talking to me. And as the fight's about to start and Jamie Foxx is coming out, I said, man, so great to see you, Denzel. Him and his son's doing great. I head back to my seat. He says, you ain't going nowhere. You sit with me today, son. When the fight starts, Michael, my goddamn phone goes off like a time bomb because you know they showed Denzel. Right. And I'm sitting there right beside him. Everybody in America is watching me. It's one of the greatest nights of my life. That is unbelievable. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing. That's such a great story. Um, You once got former Duke and Grizzly, great Shane Battier, an amazing set of uh, personalized golf clubs. Tell us a little bit how that happened. I am. I love your questions. It's funny. I just want the audience to know that, you know, I don't know how I sound. I'm just, I'm just being raw and real. You're great. And, and, you know, I wanted it. I want, I'm a perfectionist. So I wanted all these questions beforehand. You said, Martin, I don't do it like that. But uh, what was your word? You don't do what? All positive, no politics. Exactly. Man, this is a great story. I told you about, you know, the suits and get me knowing and uh, uh, the Grizzlies and, and how this marketing plan I had. But this was a night that really turned Mark Goodfellow and it's all good auto sales around. Even though I think Job ja Morant might go down as, as maybe the hottest, most talented player in the NBA Grizzlies history, to me before this, I'm not saying the most talented, but Shane Battier, to me, was the king of Memphis. He was so honored, such a professional. Every human being loved him. And they did an article, and it was in the commercial pe- uh, commercial appeal, I think I told you, about small market teams. Right. And I was passionate on that sideline. I mean, people thought I was assistant coach, you know, running down the sidelines. I don't do that anymore, but that's just who I am. And they asked Shane, you know, how do you feel about being in a small market you know, uh, a team, he says, man, me and my wife and I love it. You know, we go to the grocery store, people come up and ask us about basketball and ask us to sign our autographs. He says, I know who Mark Goodfellow is. And man, you know, he didn't have to say that. Right. He could have said a hundred things, 
but he saw the passion. And I'm telling you, the next six weeks, I sold, we sold every car on the lot. When he confirmed that he knew who Mark Goodfellow was, man, it's one of the most unbelievable uh, uh, just gestures from a man, especially Shane Battier, that was the king of Memphis and the heart and soul of our team. And I wanted to get him something. You know, what do you get a what do you get a pro athlete? Right. And back then I was big in the golf. And I loved getting here's another marketing employee. I got it's all good auto sales on every pro V1 X ball I ever bought with my phone number on the golf ball. And I didn't have to lose them. I just would leave them on the damn tee. Right. People pick them up. You know, that's just who I am. A guy that would never buy a car from me. Marketing to me is not that you can make money on them. That's when you can walk in a room and everybody will know you. That's what I think marketing is. That's my definition of marketing. I said, man, I know exactly what I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him some tailor-made balls with his name on it, with Duke Blue Devils and a basketball and his number. And when I hand him these just 12 balls, he opened up that box. It's like he hit the lottery. And five, six, seven years later, I don't want to, I don't know how many years later, he either played for Miami or he was an executive in Miami. And I have a place down there. So I used to go to Miami a lot. And I saw him in Miami. And hey, she, you know, we were good friends. I'll never forget what he did. And I said, man, how you hitting that golf ball? How'd them balls that I gave you? How'd you hit them? He said, are you kidding? I would never touch them golf balls. That was one of the greatest gifts marks I ever got. It's still on my mantle with my NBA championships. Wow. I mean, wow. That's what I said. And he was such a classy guy. Always class first class. Act. Class act. You know, you talk about Miami and um, yeah, I think a few years back, you were trying to decide if you wanted to get into real estate, but you weren't sure if you wanted to take the chance and, you did it. You signed your first real estate deal and you said afterwards, quote, what does my future lie? Cars or real estate? Either way, I feel like a kid again today, excited and anxious for my first deal, unquote. You know, most successful business people have taken risk in their lives and, and things that they weren't sure about, and, but their gut told them it was the right decision. Not all decisions work out as we know, but, you know, you just got to go for it sometimes and take a chance, don't you? Absolutely. Uh you know, it's crazy. Uh, for all the success I had at It's All Good, I, I could count at least 50 people come and want me to invest money with them. But I knew I only wanted to invest money with myself. But as you go there longer and I got all the success and I got all the money, you know, money that I wanted, uh, I knew I wanted to do something else. And when this damn pandemic came, I'm not going to lie to you. The car business is not the same. Right. Finally, I signed my first deal as a silent owner to this big, beautiful subdivision on Forest Hill, Irene. And I sort of, this has been a three-year deal, but now I'm 100% into real estate. I'm building lake homes. I have homes in Germantown. I have 50,000, 50,000 our houses in the hood. As I say, my motto, spread it around the hood. It's all good. And I'm going to rehab these homes. And I'm not going to do a half-assed job like these people do. I'm going to bring marble to the hood. I'm going to bring beautiful stuff where people can be proud of their homes. And I'm so excited. Uh, I ain't made a penny yet. But, boy, I got a lot of money out there. and I can't wait for it to see what happens in my future. You know, Mark, you also, you mentioned uh, Cal earlier, you have a pretty special relationship with uh, former University of Memphis basketball coach, John Calipari. And of course, we know he can coaches Kentucky. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Cal that you know. Man, again, I tell you, you know, my own person, uh, I'm a very unique person. Uh, I fell in love with Calipari, man. I freaking Love that damn man. Uh, just an unbelievable man. Uh, to me, he could have run for the president. Definitely could have run the mayor of the city. Uh, I got so many stories about Cal. Uh, I have to tell you one off the air. 
maybe some people are listening, but he meant the world to me. I told you it was the greatest time of my life. Uh, just an unbelievable man. I wish he never would have left. Uh, can understand, sure. you know, how, how can you turn down Kentucky, you know, his lifetime dream. Right. But he'll have a special place in my heart for sure. I'll give you one cute story about him. You know, with these, NA, N, with these NIL deals, is that correct? Yeah. NIL, whatever mm -hmm. the word is. Yeah. And all these deals and everybody says what a cheater he was and, and every school he went to. I mean, he, you know, he, he did this and he did that. I said, let me tell you something. He never asked me for a freaking dollar. My seat at the Memphis Tigers that I have right now that I have to pay for and I have to send a donation for, he gave it to me for free. Now, did I help with the players as far as if they got in trouble? Were they in a club at one o'clock in the morning? Yes. But hell, that's my MO. Right. You know, I, I was okay with that. So his kids, his kid, oh, I've got so many stories. I should have told you another, but let me finish this one. His kids went to that big, nice school out in a, a what was it, off of Walnut? They start off at White Station, but is it Briarcrest? Briarcrest on Houston Levy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he said, hey, he said, hey, Mark. Man, I did a great deal for you. I got your big pretty face on the center field wall out there in uh, Briarcrest. They said, I'm even going to pay $1,500 for it. It's $3,000. And, you know, it didn't cost, you know, it cost $1,500. He didn't put up a quarter, but he wanted me to help the school out, and I did. But let, let me tell you one more story about him. When he first came here, Oh, my God. Again, very rarely can somebody embarrass me, but I'm in that steakhouse next to the to the Peabody. Uh, what, what's it called where you put red stop and go on your steaks? Oh, oh gosh. It'll come back to me. Is, yeah, I know which one. The one that you get constantly, you have the little card that you turn over. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as I told you, I was an avid golfer. You know, I won 11 scrambles in a row. And everybody thought it was because of me. I really wasn't a good gambler, but I knew how to recruit the best golfers in Memphis. That's why I won. So we're celebrating our 11th championship in a row at that place. And that's when he got hired. I didn't know him from the man in the moon. I loved him on TV. I saw him get in a fight with John Don Chaney. Yeah. I saw him duck him just like I would have because he'd got his ass whooped, but he was trying to act tough. I just fell in love with the guy and I'm holding court as usual. I got guys there. I got women there. The servers are there. And he walks in, he walks right up to the table and he says, he says, who's the pro here? He says, cause I know that guy can't play talking to me. <laughs> I said, you motherfucker. <laughs> and he said, I want to meet you tomorrow. We met at white station. We talked for three hours about what he was going to do. And man, he did every outside of winning a in outside of winning a national championship and are you kidding nine million out of nine million and one we should have won that one that yeah. we'll never forget about but a freaking great man romeo tells me that there's so many things about cal that he still does for the city that people don't even know about unbelievable he still got a lot of close friends here for sure romeo being one of them and i know he uh I heard that he took help take care of Larry Finch's medical bills and, and family situation toward the end of his life too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, um, most people speaking of giving most people, you know, know you for your television commercials being the front row at Grizzlies and tiger games, but many don't know about all the philanthropic things you've done to give back to the community. Um, you sponsored the Westwood high school nonviolence March and rally you donated a car to parishioner of true prophetic, uh, prophetic, uh, ministries teaming up with, uh, pastor Larry Hunter, who I happen to have the pleasure of meeting him several years ago and working with him once too, donating some mattresses to him. You know, you help supply money, food, toys, and Christmas gifts for hundreds of families. Um, so you've done a lot, you know, and about four years ago, someone put up a Facebook post about you that said, quote, witness something today. I have to share. 
I was at Smoothie King on Highland while I was waiting for my order to be made. Mark Goodfellow walks in. He notices a lady he knows and goes and talks to her. And he's talking to her a few minutes later, a few firemen walk in and walk to the counter. Mark stops his conversation with the lady and quickly walks straight to the counter. First, I thought he was going to try to get his order in front and first, but boy, was I wrong. He handed the Smoothie King employee his credit card and quietly said, I'm paying for their drinks too. Then he calmly goes back and walks to the lady, continues talking. You know, what a great story of, of genuineness and heart. You, you give a lot back to those in need and, and those who aren't in need too. And, you know, I feel like I already probably know part of the answer, but why do you do both the big and little things too and give so much back? Well, you know, I learned from my mom again. Uh, I didn't always go by her, you know, rules, but, you know, she was such a good person to me. But the firefighters, I don't want to talk about what I do for people, but firefighters and Memphis policemen to this day, if I see them in any restaurant anywhere, I will pick up their tab. They risk their lives. They risk their lives every day for us for small pay. And I'm just so appreciative of people that can do that. Yeah, I was about to say that was the next thing I was talking about is that you talk about how much you posted about how much you know policemen, what they do risking their lives every day. People really have no idea what it's like to be a police officer, especially in today's world. I mean, those people, men and women leave their home every day, not knowing if they're coming home at night. And they just people don't have any idea what they go through, do they? Unreal, Michael. I've never been as scared a day in my life. Uh, I love Memphis. Memphis made me, but I'm not going to lie to you. I'm scared to go out at night, man. If I'm out at a Grizzly game, if I'm out at dinner, I'm in my damn bed. The crime in this city is just ridiculous. These young kids don't give a shit about Mark Goodfellow, Ja Morant. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a, and I'm not saying Memphis, it's everywhere. Right. But man, and they're risking their lives every day with families, with this city right now, with the new prosecuting attorney which I don't want to talk talk bad about him, talking about defunding the police. I want to give police raises, man. Yep. Are you kidding? Yeah. You know, another thing um, that you did for someone turns out to be a huge thing. It was just something small. Your friend uh, Keith Dory posted back in 2019 that he wanted to take a six-year-old to an NBA game, and and uh, he called you for the hookup, and he, and he said, quote, hello, world. Thanks, Mark those things to do you help hook them up with some tickets you're not you know i know you don't do those things for credit you know it's just something inside of you that makes you do that for people isn't it yeah it's just you know i feel like i'm truly blessed uh you know my, my whole life money was my life man and i realized money don't make you happy right you know i grew up with nothing i was the happiest guy in the world Run around the dog track. I made money, but hell, the next day I might have lost it back. But not, growing up and just, you know, I also grew up in church. I'm not saying, I'm not saying I'm a, you know, I don't want any accolades from, you know, I don't go to church, but I got a great relationship with God. And, you know, there's a lot of unfortunate people out there. And I love, what's crazy to me is, is anything I do for somebody, it puts a smile on their face. It freaking makes me happy. It is unbelievable. Now, a girl, it's another story. You know, paying for girl. Now, I don't do that stuff, but, you know, I'm getting a little bit older. But, you know, it's just a great story, and hell, I got it. I mean, I don't want to take all my money with me. I want to bless people, especially people that have helped me. And Keith's been a great, great friend of mine. You know, after the uh, pandemic started back in March of 2020, you said, quote, although the circumstances of this pandemic are unfortunate, I wanted to express my sincere condolences for everyone affected. After the rain, there will always be sun. Together as a community, we can turn this into something great. Be kind, be humble, and be giving during these dire times. I wish everyone happiness, blessings, and love, unquote. You were obviously, you know, wanted to encourage people during some really hard times, weren't you? Oh, absolutely. I can't believe where you're getting all this stuff from. Uh, you're touching my heart with this. And yeah, we you know, we have to come together as a community. I mean, this has been unbelievable. Could you ever imagine what we went through? Never. You know, all the people that we lost, I lost my brother to this sick disease. 
I've lost one of my most special friends, Stanley Rosenblum, that got me that first Forest Hill Irene deal that negotiated the whole deal for me. I didn't know what I was doing. Plenty of people have lost their loved ones. I mean, we've got to come together, man. Unbelievable. You know, that, that's actually was the next person I was going to bring up is Stanley. Uh, I knew him myself. Uh, he was my landlord at my first uh, space, second space I had back at Perkins and Dine Arnold. He owned a little building over there, and I had a mattress store back from 2002 to 2004. And I was just starting out in business. He was so nice to me, gave me such good advice. He was, char- you know, he was just charismatic, uh, just really good guy. And you said of Stanley, quote, a mentor, someone I looked up to, someone whose words I valued. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with him. Oh, my God. I could go on three hours about him. He, you might know this, but you might not. He used to be a professional gambler. I didn't know that. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. He was a professional handicapper at the freaking dog track. Now, this store is as good as anything. And he used to put his turn calls, if you know what a turn call is, you know, where the dogs were going to go to the first turn. Okay. He'd put them on his, on his, you know, on his program. And I'd sneak up and all I'd have to do is get his turn call and I could guess the winner from there. So I would get the turn call first and then say, Hey, Stanley. And immediately he'd put his hand right there on the turn call, but I already got it. 33 years in a row, he made at least a quarter of a million. Now that's not a lot of money now, but think in 19 freaking 82. Right. Un- 77. I think he was there in the seventies. He was unbelievable. A very, uh, uh, you know, not a big, just a very, uh, I wouldn't say cheap, but a very frugal, better knew everything. He also was a little smart ass. He had an unbelievable personality. He was so freaking funny. Uh, and one time I, I really, really, really embarrassed him. Uh, it's something I don't take back because, you know, I really loved him. Uh, his son, his son had a bad drug problem. Maybe share that with you. He did. Uh, should I continue? Cause it's yeah. deep. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I can get ticked off easy. You follow me, you know, and, and, and I, I don't get jealous of people, but it's just a fact he was just more brilliant and brighter than me, man. It's it, it just, it, there's no more ways around it. And sometimes we smarted off to him. It pissed me off. And I'm a man of a lot of words and I don't close my mouth for nobody. If you catch me in the wrong situation. So we're at his 50th freaking anniversary party. Now this is the last thing I should do this. And he's holding court. He was funny. You know him. Yeah. He was unbelievable, you know, on all the shopping centers in Memphis. Well, that's because of me, but he'll never give me credit for. So he's standing up a toast and he says something else smart to me. And he says what he's got to say at his 50th year anniversary. And I hold up my cup. And I say, I want a toast. I said, Stanley, let me tell you something about you. All these great and all these great men were there, and, and he touched a lot of people too. I says, You are brilliant, but I said, Let me tell you something, you're also one of the dumbest motherfuckers in the country. I said, You're sitting at a dog track for 33 years making $250,000, which is peanuts, which the million you should have been making, but more than that. You're going you're you're the one that's gonna kill your son by embedding him and paying him money every week. Everybody was shocked, but they gave me a, everybody started clapping because nobody could tell them that. You know, I know a little bit about drugs too, which I don't want to get into, but you cannot keep helping a drug. You got to get them help. And I understand he was his father, but that was the worst movie ever made. I said, quit this gambling, get into a real business and get your son some help. And he did them all. And look what he turned into. Wow. I can't even imagine the quietness in that room. Just the shock from people who needed that. You couldn't hear a mouse 
and then the wife started first. Once she started clapping, I knew I had them. It was the truth. It wasn't the right time to say it, but I said it. You said once, quote, stop and thank God you're still alive and enjoy your weekend. We all know our birthday, but we never know our death date. Live it to the fullest. It seems like that's something that you do. You know, that's a great quote by me. Again, you know, with, with all my great uh, things that are happened to me, I've truly never traveled more than you know, three hours, because I'm very hyper. And you know, I've been to some beautiful places, Carousel, Jamaica, Bahamas, but never Italy, Rome, Switzerland, Paris, blah, blah, blah. So when I said that, I'm ready to, you know, I'm so blessed. You know, I'm so blessed outside of losing my mom and my brother. But, you know, that just happens in life. And you know, I got the great teachings from my mother. Uh, I'm ready just to travel the world and live a great life and, and, you know, let these small things that upset me, I I'm over that now. I I'm drama free. That was my competitiveness. And, and I think I'm going to bring it back in this real estate, but I'm ready to smile, uh, turn this other ego off I had and just live and, 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 and bring Memphis Grizzlies a freaking NBA championship. That would be my ultimate goal. And I will go to my death grave, even though I'm the I'm all about W and L's. I will go to my death grave saying that we should have won the NBA championship last year if freaking John ja Morant don't get hurt, and or if Dylan Brooks don't get suspended and we win that next game. Right. Yeah, I agree with you, hundred percent. Um, you know, on your birthday three years ago, you said, "quote God has truly blessed me with a wonderful family and amazing friends. I'm so grateful for each of you, and want to thank every one of you who took time out of their day to wish me happy birthday. It truly meant a lot. Make me smile and made my day special. A wise man friend told me my second half of life will be better than the first. At this point in life, no truer words were ever spoken. You know, you're obviously very grateful and, and lucky to have such wonderful people around you that love and care about you, aren't you?" Oh, man, that was Bernard Faber. Uh, you know, you always wonder why I was so tight, you know. Uh, some of the reasons for my success, you know, let's just say four, five, six, seven, eight years ago in my prime, uh, you know, I sold, I think, 202 cars in one week. I mean, that was a record week. But I don't go about last week. I go about the following week. And that's all I've lived. I've lived week by week my whole life. I don't care about what I did in the last six, seven months. I care about, you know, what I do now. And I'm just trying to forget about all that. I'm just trying to live. Uh, I'm trying to get closer to God. You know, I talk to God all the time. You know, I've got an unbelievable story. And I think that's coming out next. I want to save kids' lives. Uh, uh, my life is not what pe people think it is. And that's another true story. But I think... I have the passion and I have a great story to help, you know, young kids that, uh, or even a, a grown man, but I feel like young kids are our future right. and I, I have a story to help them. I, I just got to get there. I need somebody that's maybe listening to this podcast that, that, that that's, that's godly spirited. Uh, I'm a tough guy to deal with, but if I believe in you and trust you, I have so much powerful uh, information for, for people in the future. Uh, tell us about your friendship with uh, Marty Austin. Say that again. Uh, your friendship with Marty Austin. Oh, my friendship with Marty Austin. Uh, that also came with Rusty. Uh, Marty's the one that got me involved with Rusty. Uh, you know, Marty, Marty's a great guy too. Uh, it was so funny. I'll give you one story about Marty. We we flew to, again in the private jet. I mean, imagine taking a private jet every week. And oh, and here's the kicker. I ain't got to pay a dollar. It don't cost me a dollar. Yeah, I brought wine and, you know, little gifts like that. But, you know, does anybody know what a private jet costs an hour now? It's crazy. And we're in Biloxi and and – 
you know, everybody wanted to kiss Rusty's ass. And, you know, you can ask Romeo, I don't kiss nobody's ass. Right. And, 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 and we're playing blackjack and, you know, I've sort of walk around and I'm looking at Rusty and, and Marty's there like his damn bodyguard and Rusty's, you know, down about 50, 60,000. And he says, man, man, you can't come up to the table. I said, Marty, don't fucking tell me now. I do what I want. I said, when I come to the table, I'm going to change his luck. He won like a hundred thousand when I sat down for 30 minutes. And again, I told him, I said, Marty, when you invite Elvis on the plane, son, you're second fiddle from here on out. That <laughs> sort of awesome. pissed him off. But Marty's a good guy. We've been a lot of places together. And all this re you reunites back through Rusty Heineman. Um, you spoke earlier about your uh, brother, uh, Matthew. You lost him a few years ago from complications from COVID. Uh, you called him, quote, the funniest guy in the world, father of three beautiful girls, the life of the party, and everybody's favorite person. Tell us a little bit about him. Man, uh, I hope this don't sound braggadocious. This is just a fact. My brother when we grew up, never got a freaking word in because it was the Mark Goodfellow show. Right. But he had to watch me for years and years, being the top athlete and this and that, and being my little brother. I'll never forget this. My senior year, 1982, like he'd be watching a show or whatever. It'd be right in a, five minutes to go on a show. I wouldn't give a shit. I'd come in and just rip the TV to another channel. And in 1982, my brother was getting real big, but I knew he had a lot of respect for me, so he wasn't ever going to do nothing. My brother, you, you know, King Cotton, I don't know if it was King Cotton, but just any hot dog brand. Yeah. You know, how, you know how we munch on chips and dip or might snack on shit? He snacked on raw hot dogs. I mean, my brother could eat a freaking raw, 12 raw hot dogs. You know, Poncho's Cheese Dip, one of my best favorite cheese dip of all times. Yes. Back in the day, you could go to Poncho's Cheese Dip and get 10 dips. My brother changed all that. Now you could get one, and you had to buy the next one. I came in that day and switched that channel, and that son of got up and got me by my hand and started pressuring my hand. I started squiddling like a little baby. I never messed with my brother again. Remember I told you I got kicked out of the house. About five, six, seven years, I told you I was a little crazy back then. I hated my whole family for it, including my loving mother that would have died for me. The reason why I'm still living today is because my mother, the most horrible thing I ever did is to freaking put that against her. She had nothing to do with it. You know, it was my dad. You know, your dad runs your household. But I hated my brother, my sister, everything. And I snuck in town one day and I'm at the Peabody and I'm having a drink with the girl. And again, you know, my brother never got a word in. I've, I haven't seen him in six, seven years. And I see this big guy. I can't even see him, but I hear somebody at the bar holding court. There's whites, blacks, there's everybody up there. And I peek around and it's my damn brother. And I start listening to him and just, I'm just smiling within. I'm knowing he got all this stuff from me. And the crazy thing is my nickname is Goody. His nickname was Goody also. So I wanted to sneak out because I wanted to give him all the praise because, you know, I still was a godfather. And I knew if he saw me, he'd try to, you know, bust my balls. So as I'm sneaking out, somebody says, no, 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 come up here, Goody. And here he goes. He starts messing with me. And as a brother, and I know how bad I treated him. I let him bust my balls about twice. Now, on the third one, I held my finger. I said, that's it. Not another word. But after that, man, you never, I'm sure you've heard good, bad, and indifferent about me. Everybody talked good about my brother. His kids loved him. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. We were not that close. We were just about to get close. We owned that big pallet lot, like I told you. You know, my daddy was tough. I told my brother he needs to get away from my father, that he'll never get that dealership. I mean, the pallet lot. But my brother was the good son. He thought he would. He never got it. But finally, when my dad got sick, 
he finally was about to get that pallet lot and really, really make some money. And we were having some great conversations about our life. I was so proud to be next to him. And boom, he's gone. Just a sad, sick day. And, you know, I'm a strong man and I can take it. But his kids, God, do I feel for them. He's got three beautiful young girls. You know, one thing I say, you know, about death that I've heard from other people, and you probably heard too, you, you never get over it, but you do get through it. You know, it's sure. hard as heck as it is. You never get over it. I've lost a father, and I know you've lost your mother, and you just, but you know, the, I think that I believe that their energy and soul lives forever and that their spirit is around us all the time. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a crying person, but I mean, just two weeks ago, I was in Houston's restaurant and somebody just told me they were sorry about my brother, you know, years later. It's just, I just love hearing good things about him. Um, Mark, I saw a picture of you with your grandbaby. I believe it's Myla. Yeah. Uh, she's adorable. Uh, I bet you have to spoil the heck out of her, don't you? Uh, uh, you know, that's another thing. I, I haven't been a great, you know, I haven't been a great, uh, you know, granddaddy, but, you know, that's another thing I'm trying to change in my life, man. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, you know, a lot of things have, have just changed. I had all this time and man, is she something else. She is a freaking queen and uh, I'm really trying to get there. Awesome. I want to let people know that, you know, I'm not perfect, man. I got a lot of flaws too, but man, am I trying. Am I trying to do the right things? Yes. Uh, I'm a huge dog lover, and I know you are too. Uh, tell us about uh, who you call the new little goody, uh, your boy Cosmo. <laughs> he's my freaking man. He's my freaking life. I just let him. I just let him out today before I came to this thing. I had to. I had to rush him a little bit because I had to make this uh, interview. Uh, man, he is my life. I found him during the pandemic with a girl that I was dating and uh, I always loved dogs, but you know, my house looks like a Russian czar. I couldn't have no dog around my house, right. but this dog, man, I didn't care, man. This is the most athletic young dog in the country. Uh, one day I live in a little uh, uh, a private you know, gated area, only six homes. And I live right off of Poplar. And he's like a little greyhound. And that's what I grew up, you know, gambling on greyhounds. When you let him out of the house, he just starts running a million miles an hour. I know he loves me to death, but I could carry. He just, you can't stop him. Thank God I got a private gate. Well, one day when he was running and running through my damn, I love flowers. I just redone my, well, I didn't do it, but got my flowers made. He just runs right through my flowers and ruins it. I strip up. I'm ready to kill the little son of a gun. And the gate opens on Poplar. And he made a complete U-turn and starts running on Poplar. You know oh Poplar, God. the busiest street in Memphis. My heart is stopping as I'm talking. I'm running out there. He almost, I almost get killed. He almost gets killed. And I realize that he couldn't stay with me anymore. And I have a, you talking about somebody that I owe my life to right now. I'm sure they're not listening, but Mark Cooper, Mark Cooper and Eva Ferris took him in and man, and there's, they fell in love with him too. Everybody that sees him falls in love with him and lets me see him whenever I want. Awesome. I've been through, I, I would give my life for that freaking dog. He is my absolute, every time I'm with him, I feel good in my heart just being around that dog. Absolutely. He's the love of my life. Um, I saved the uh, most precious person in your world for last to talk about, and you've mentioned her several times, and that's your mom. I, I know you lost her to cancer several years ago, and you guys had such an amazing bond. Uh, a few of the many things you've posted about her are, quote, Mama, I miss you, love you, I know you're here with me, and I have become the man you've always wanted me to be. And then also, quote, Words cannot express how much I miss and love you. I think about you every day and I've become a better man. I love you. 
And, you know, you said one of the last trips that you had with her, you were coming home from treatment. You were guys were listening to Donna summer in the car and she didn't want you to take her home because she was enjoying being with you so much. Um, and you know, lastly, your friend, uh, trainer Jennings, the third said about you quote, you did more than most sons would do when your mom had cancer. You absolutely did everything you could do. Most people only see you on the front row or flying to Miami. They don't see the biggest heart I've seen in my life and the type of person you are glad to call you a friend. Seeing the way you loved your mom is one of the reasons I started having Friday lunches with my mom, unquote. I mean, I really don't have any words to describe all that love. I mean, if you could and you're up to it, can you just share just maybe a little bit about her? Yeah. Yeah, she was she she was my everything. She's the reason why I'm living. You know, you know. I guess every mama does this, you know, just not my mom, but man, I don't supposed to be here. And my mother loved me, loved me, loved me, just loved me to death. Everybody loved her. Uh, you know, when I tell you I'm a marketer, I mean that. And I, I market, for instance, you know, a Facebook post, an Instagram post. I don't put up a Facebook post just to put it up. I put it up to get 300, 400, 500 likes. And I pay attention to that. And three, four, five, six, seven times over the years, I put something about my mom up and she'll get six, 650, 700 likes more than me. She just, she was the life of the party. She kept our family together. Uh, it was not fair what happened to her. She invited everybody into her home. And I'm talking about white or black. You know, she loved me for who I am, for my girlfriends, for anything. I just, I, I just, when she died, you know, again, I, I was crazy, man. I was crazy, but I tried to change my life the day she died, and I've tried to leave a positive message and help anybody that I can because she was so loving and caring, and thanks for bringing her up. She's, she's, she's the reason why I'm here today, and to me, everything that you said today, I have not done enough, and I hope uh, you, you mentioned trainer. He's getting me back in the church, and I hope that I can spread my story, and I can help a whole lot of people in the future. This would be for my mom. I think this is a this podcast is a great beginning to that, and um, I, I th I'm excited for people to to watch this and, and see the real you the one that they don't you know see from television because this is having you on today has been awesome yeah i uh i tell you that you know when i think about when people say you know you take what you do seriously as far as your work but you try not to take yourself too seriously and you've been able to um you know enjoy life everybody has their ups and downs as greg raver says you know working with me we have our ebbs and flows and um, we just, you know, just got to keep going on because, you know, we know that that's what our loved ones that have passed would want. They would not want us to sit there and, you know, dwell on everything that, you know, happened. They would want us to continue on and have a good life. Yes, sir. Mark, thanks so much for coming on today. I, I really appreciate your time. And I'd love to have you on again sometime down the road too. Yes, sir. All right. Thank Loves you. It. Thank you so much.